Africa, we started from a very skeptical point of view. Three very independent layers of arguments that kind of prove each other. Holes in the ear are not caused by any kind of psychosomatic. Cluster of symptoms is pretty unique. Exceedingly uncommon. Uh, so they only have the recidivist, repeat offender status, just so you know. Uh, it looks like that they just don't don't understand the possible consequences of their silence right now. Hi, I'm Michael Weiss. Welcome back to Foreign Office. Uh, today's episode is a special one because I'm acting as both host and fellow guest. Uh, my other two guests are Christo Grozev, he's the head of investigations at The Insider, and Roman Dabrohotov, the founder and editor-in-chief of The Insider, and I am um, the editor of The Insider's English language portal. Um, and today's show is about our big investigative report done in conjunction with 60 Minutes and Der Spiegel into Havana syndrome and possible connections to Russian intelligence uh, behind what the U.S. government calls anomalous health incidents, and not just any uh, unit of Russian intelligence, but specifically one that should be familiar to listeners of the show, uh, Unit 29155 of the GRU. This is an assassination and sabotage squad responsible for uh, poisoning Sergei and Yulia Skripal in Salisbury, Emilian Gibrev, a Bulgarian arms dealer in Sofia, uh, and uh, orchestrating a coup in Montenegro. And if you follow the work the insider has done in the past several months, a series of explosions, uh, terrorist attacks, really, uh, of Bulgarian and Czech ammunition and weapons facilities. So 29155 has been rather busy in the last decade. And we're going to talk about uh, our work with 60 Minutes and how we went about um, uncovering evidence that puts 29155 operatives at the scene of the crime, as it were. Uh, two incidents involving Havana syndrome victims who had positively identified two separate members of 29155 um, years apart, about eight years apart, in, and a thousand miles apart, uh, one in Tbilisi, Georgia, and the other in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, I want to start with you, Christo. Um, we've been working on this for about a year ourselves, but 60 Minutes has been doing this for five years. This is the fourth or fifth segment they've done on Havana. This story has kind of taken off like wildfire. Um, I know that it's been read and digested at very, very high levels at the U.S. government and in the intelligence community. Walk us through a little bit about what we uncovered here, and, and, and you in particular in, in sort of mapping. I mean, you're, you're probably the first person to have identified the existence of this military unit, uh, and we, we have a database, essentially, of, of all the known members, at least up until very recently. So what was our methodology here? What did we do? Well, first, let me just correct you a little bit, because we didn't really work just for a year on this. Uh, Roman and I started looking into this probably in 2020 at the latest. Uh, it's when a lot of people came forward complaining that um, they were former operatives from the U.S. government or the CIA. Uh, many of them had left uh, because they were victims or they had family members who had been hit. And they felt that this is not really given sufficient uh, diligence by their own agency and they had turned to us as investigative journalists with some success before that um, to look into it to give it a second uh, look and we we did that we slow paced it slow walked it because it's a very controversial topic uh, we started from a very skeptical point of view uh, i will let roma speak for himself but i did start with, as a skeptic thinking how would this work and the biggest question for me was not really how would this work technically because we're never fully aware of all the technical developments and of course we might be surprised and we should be surprised because governments should know better than we do the biggest question for me was was there the capability for such a mass global um attack by any government would, would any government have the people to send to locations where this was happening and, and as time went by we heard about, about more and more locations initially it was havana but then out of the wood, woodwork came uh, Geneva, Vienna, Berlin, um, uh, Phuket, and uh, Hanoi, Belgrade. So who would have the capability to do all of that? So that was kind of the thing that gave us reason to be skeptics. So nobody has that um, capability. And if anybody did, we thought it would be the Russians with their unit to Namwasa 5, which is supported by a lot of local chief of stations. Uh, basquerading as military attaches around the world. 
but we didn't have enough evidence to point to any particular overlap or any number of overlaps, which would give us the hypothesis this may be them. Mm -hmm. And then, as time went by, we discovered this very, very, very interesting document, which initially we ignored, again, as a not sufficiently overlapping with the topic. The document was in the mailbox of one of the commanders of um, Unit 2955. In fact, in the email box of the eighth assistant to that commander, who was sort of doing his paperwork for a new Kremlin job that this commander had uh, just got promoted to. This was in 2019, and uh, it referred to a um, sort of a tax declaration or an anti-corruption declaration that this commander of Unit 2955 had failed to complete properly when he applied for the Kremlin job. He didn't apply, he was given the job, but they still had to go through the motions. And he had forgotten to mention a particular income stream that had taken place at the end of 2017. And that referred to some uh, competition that he had won. And uh, there was a back and forth between this assistant to the commander and the Kremlin accountant saying, well, I need explanations why he didn't uh, report this money. Ultimately, attached to this mail chain is a document which literally says this money is given for ending over all the IP rights in research terms in the context of a competition, which this commander won. The competition was titled Finding the Perspectives for Use of Acoustic Weapon in Urban Warfare Scenarios. So this is literally what connected this unit potentially in our heads to this um, uh, Havana weapon. And then we started looking for incidents of overlap between uh, travel of, of members of this unit, and we, better than anyone I think out in the world, have a complete picture of who's a member and who's an aide to this unit. We we have probably about 100 names by now, uh, people who travel undercover around the world, including people who are local helpers, local uh, military attaches or other diplomat cover helpers of this unit around the world. And we started finding overlaps. So this is where, really, for the last year, we've been trying to perfect and fine-tune the overlaps. That's how it, we got to this. And I mean, a large, a great deal of weight in this investigation uh, has to do with the very remit of 29155. Um, it had been reported before the Office of the Director of National Intelligence came out a year ago with its finding that it is, quote, very unlikely that a foreign adversary is behind these anomalous health incidents, that, you know, the U.S. Uh, intelligence community had been able to geolocate uh, GRU registered vehicles, kind of sort of in the vicinity of where these alleged attacks took place. But that led to the analysis that, well, there are Russian spies everywhere, right? And they're always snooping and collecting data and doing surveillance. But 29155 uh, has a very, very specific raison d'etre, right? They do assassinations. They do sabotage. They, they blow things up. And they use homemade detonators and explosive devices to do it, which we showed in one of our previous investigations. In the case of Montenegro, they, they sponsor and orchestrate coups to overthrow governments. Um, there's been some hacking and other things that they do as well, but their very presence in the location of, of where these attacks took, took place. And again, we had two eyewitnesses who positively identify Yegor Gorienko and Albert Avrianov in two different cities separated by like almost a decade. Their very presence begs the question, well, if they weren't wielding some directed energy device and, and, and conducting these attacks, what the hell were they doing there? Right. I mean, the, the, the intelligence community has the burden of, of explaining to all of us what is the alternative explanation for why these specific Russian intelligence operatives were in these places. Roman, Christo alluded to the fact you were a little bit skeptical coming into this investigation. Why did you not think that 29155 might have any um, responsibility for Havana syndrome? And, and I, I want to emphasize, we haven't definitively proven this. We have just laid out all the evidence which hitherto had been not in the public domain. And as far as I'm concerned, based on the reporting that's followed from this investigation, hadn't been in the hands of very senior people in the intelligence community. So, Ramon, explain your skepticism uh, uh, initially going into this. Uh, so, first of all, I think that we were um, skeptical maybe in the first year, but I remember that in all of the 2020, uh, one, I think, I, because I, I remember that I was in Vienna at that time, I spoke with Yulia Yoff and she asked, and we said already that we found some scientists that research something that is not Novichok, but they speak with uh, GRU agents, and this is very suspicious. And uh, uh, so we, we think that uh, 
the Havana syndrome may be real? And she asked, like, how likely you think it can be? And I said, like, around 75%. And she was actually very surprised because though she wrote this big article uh, about this, she almost, like, broke the story when the, the vast majority of people didn't know about this, uh, she herself at this point was not sure. So this was a time when in public discourse it was like some very strange theory that needs to be proven. Uh, but we already thought that it, it, is, it is worth pursuing. And I think that now what we have is not just coincidence of the trips and not just eyewitnesses. We have three dimensions of this um, investigation and arguments. The first is these trips. The second is that we have documents that prove that the, this concrete military unit made research of so-called acoustic weapon, as they call it. Yep. And uh, another uh, dimension is medical dimension that, first of all, proves that this is statistically impossible that such big amount of people have so-called minor syndrome. And secondly, we know that this syndrome you, can you explain what that is? Yes, we, I, I, we I, I, I will elaborate a bit. little bit uh, about this yeah. more, but I will just um, mention that I, uh, like statistical idea that, first of all, we know that uh, we have too many people who have, this, uh, who have this syndrome. And secondly, we know that this concrete sy syndrome was researched in Russia only by one medical ac academy because it's very rare. It was researched only by the, this concrete military uh, academy where the people from 2955 work. And we know that like, Mishkin, for example, graduated from this military academy, that Sergei Chipur, who is like number one in Avidyanov phone calls, he is professor in this academy. So this cannot be coincidence. So we have these three, uh, three very independent uh, layers of arguments that kind of prove each other. And speaking about uh, minor syndrome itself, so um, it is it is uh, recently actually found that syndrome in, in 1990s. Uh, that that means that if you have uh, some problems with your some ear bones uh, in some certain conditions, you can develop uh, symptoms such as um, loss of balance, uh, some strange noises, um, um, so-called um, like hyper uh, hyper accusation when you hear very uh, soft sounds as annoyingly loud, and you can even hear uh, the movements of your eyeballs. So some some um, physiological processes from inside your head start sound something for you. So this is very irritating. This is very problematic. You can't actually continue working in the in these kind of conditions. And and this like cluster of symptoms is pretty unique. So you can't just uh, so no, there are not a lot of things that can have this cluster. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was invented in it was found in the um, ninety middle of nineteen nineties, uh, and was called minor syn syndrome for uh, the doctor from Stanford who founded that. And uh, we already contacted him, and uh, uh, I, I hope that we will continue our research uh, together with the best doctors who can uh, explain us more about the statistics of, of this, how, how widespread this thing is, and how this phys um, physiology works. But it looks like that the microwave, impulse microwaves can really cause this syndrome. And just a little more context. so. Um... In the 60 Minutes broadcast, um, we they showed Joy, uh, we're calling her Joy, who is the the spouse of an American diplomat stationed in Tbilisi, um, who was hit in 2021. She is the one who positively identified Albert Abrianov, the son of uh, Andrei Abrianov, the the founding commander of 29155, who Roman mentioned is constantly in contact with Dr. Chapur. Um, and she has had two surgeries uh, for minor syndrome. She's had holes in the, the bones of her inner ear, had to have metal plates on both sides of her head, probably facing a third surgery. So we incorporated the fact that she was suffering from this very rare condition, which has a more clinical name as well, um, 
and the fact that Dr. Chapur, of all people, his research facility was one of the few places in Russia to the only have one any place clinical. In Russia. Yes, the, only. the only place in Russia. And suddenly, um, we were contacted by several other people, including two Canadians who similarly were diagnosed with this thing, and one CIA officer who was hit in Warsaw and also London, who also has a diagnosis. And according to Dr. David Relman, funnily enough, the, the leading scientific investigator into Havana syndrome who wrote or co-chaired the expert panel report on plausible causes for it in 2022, uh, works at Stanford University and the dean of his particular college is Lloyd Minor, the doctor who discovered this condition. So uh, we, we asked him, so what, what, what do you know about this thing? And he said, I spoke to him uh, just this morning, it's something like 0.5% of the population have it but an even smaller subset of the population are symptomatic and require the kind of medical inter intervention that these victims had. And I said, and of all the cases of, of AHI, the fact that there are already four people who've been diagnosed with it, he says that's exceedingly uncommon. Right, right. So, I mean, this is another line of inquiry, right? And, and the fact that also there's a, a, a tangible physiological effect. I mean, one of the arguments against Havana syndrome being real is that it's a sociogenic illness. This is all psychosomatic. You know, I talk about weird symptoms to you. You start to develop them, but there's no proof. There's nothing in MRI brain scans that just to suggest brain damage, et cetera. But holes in the ear are not caused by any kind of psychosomatic, you know, problem. I mean, that that is a physical uh, medical condition. Um, so, Christo, walk me through a little bit about why, you know, this investigation in particular has been so controversial. I mean, some of the pushback we're getting um, on social media, in correspondence is, well, okay, great, you know, circumstantial evidence, very interesting, 29155 in these places, they're doing research into acoustic weapons, but hey, everyone's doing research into acoustic weapons. No doubt the Americans are doing it, uh, the French, the Germans, the British. Um, you haven't shown that, you know, Albert Avrianov is literally pulling the trigger of some device or a gun firing ultrasound or microwave radiation at, at these people. Um, and yet, this is evidence that has not come to light yet, right? I mean, this, it, it's in the public interest to know that the, the assessment that it is very unlikely a foreign adversary has anything to do with this is a little more complicated. I mean, we can add to what we've just said. In open source, the Russians have been boasting about researching and developing exactly these kinds of weapons for years. Putin has said that by whatever year it was, we'll have directed energy weapons. Uh, the former defense minister in Russia, um, uh, Serdukov, was talking about by 2022, we'll have all of these new devices. Um, explain why you think that there's more of a compelling case here for attribution. Well, first of all, uh, if you treat this whole incident as a series of crimes, and if there was a uh... Uh, an organized crime group or a regular criminal on the other side, on the, the culprit side, um, it would be possible to call that culprit into a courtroom and to, for a prosecutor to interrogate them and to question them, and they would be able to present their defense arguments. It's a more complicated situation here. We have an espionage agency of a particular type, of a particular country, that would always obfuscate and deny and lie whether they were complicit to this or, or not. And what we're having here is another agency uh, belonging to the country that represents most of the victims that has also reasons to either tell the truth or to obfuscate and lie because there are many reasons why the uh, intelligence community at large of the United States might not want the full truth told at this point in time. So in a very, we are in a very unique situation where we have to have at least a prosecutor putting out the potential hypothesis, the charges, and somebody acting also as a defense uh, for the lawyer for the for these criminals who also happen to be a government. What we've done so far is we've presented the argument for the prosecution, and it's I believe it's a consistent, concise argument. It includes the three critical ingredients of any um, any convincing prosecution case, which is motive, um, opportunity and uh, means or motive means and opportunity motive is clear i mean putin has put it out in the open in 2012 he said we need this kind of weapon because other weapons are old-fashioned and something interesting that he said there uh, as well is unlike traditional conventional weapons including nuclear um 
something that uses new phenomenon of new physical methods and, and, and in this particular string of uh, examples he gave, ray weapons and directed energy weapons are less politically controversial. What does that mean? They will not get the immediate reaction that the use of a nuclear weapon or a gun would, would do because they are, some of them are no lethal and they are harder right. to track. So motive is there. I mean, it's been out there. Let's add to the motive the fact that uh, Patrushev himself, Nikolai Patrushev, the head of the National Security Council of Russia, a year ago boasted that over the last 10 years they've disabled hundreds of American and Western intelligence operatives um, and disabled. We, we haven't heard of assassinations of 100 uh, operatives, but we've heard right. of hundreds disabled. So the motive... Neutralized. Yes, the motive, the motive yeah. is there. The means, well, we've seen that the Russians at least believe that they have the means because they've awarded this particular commander, and that's the only one that we've seen. We, we must have many, many other such projects that are considered to be uh, completed and awarded, but that we have at least one proof that they believe one, one particular type of acoustic weapon is working. And then the question is, do they have the opportunity? And now we've proven that a unit that has no other brief than to assassinate, disable, blow up things they have no capability to do traditional intelligence in terms of data gathering they have medical doctors on each of their forays on each of their teams which is only consistent with a kinetic operation on something that can have a blowback on their own people either poisoning with novichok where they can touch the the bottle and, and poison themselves or exposure to a kinetic uh, energy weapon which may blow back on them and by the way, a lot of the research that has been done in this, in this area has resulted in collateral damage to the scientists themselves because it's a dangerous mm. thing to do if you accidentally right. shoot yourself with a ray, with a ray gun. It's not the best thing that, um, that you can hope for. So we have the three ingredients in place. And I've seen a lot of uh, pushback by, by people saying, no, that's not motive. Why would they disable spies? I, I think any reasonable person will know why they're doing that. What If they could, why they would do that. So what we have now is at least a hypothesis that shows six by now overlaps that uh, this team has temporarily and location-wise with incidents. Now, what has to happen in the normal world here? Somebody must act as a defense attorney for these criminals, for these, uh, for these criminals, and they're criminals because they're already indicted on other charges of assassinating right. or attempted assassinations. Uh, so they only have the recidivist, repeat offender status, just so you know. Uh, Oh, nobody's doing that except for people randomly on the internet saying we don't believe so you know who should do that the u.s government should do that the u.s government should come forward yeah. and say why we believe that this is not it because what would they build so far is a black box refusal and denial it's a black box we don't know why they conclude that there's no foreign interference here we've given them one reason to believe otherwise and they should say no we believe they were there for a different reason we know that they were there to poison somebody, right? We don't need to know what exactly that is because maybe they have the reasons to keep that uh, secret. But they should come forward and say we know what they were doing in these places and only then we can start pursuing different avenues. I think also one of the, the nuances that's lost here is, you know, people say the intelligence community has dismissed this as a, a, a non a nothing, right? And there's no, no phenomenon here. Um, yes, the victims have suffered. They're being paid compensation. Some of them are anyway. Um, but there's no proof of anything, um, and, and we should all go home. Except the intelligence community is a very large, sprawling, expansive apparatus consisting of you know, more specific agencies than Americans are aware of. But of the top ones, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and the Defense Intelligence Agency, there were varying levels or assessments in confidence of the, the attribution or the, the, the finding, rather, that uh, there was, it's very unlikely a foreign adversary is responsible for this. And on the show, 60 Minutes, last Sunday, Greg Ed Green, a uh, retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army, the lead investigator for the Defense Intelligence Agency, I mean, funnily enough, the, the American counterpart to the GRU, said categorically, this is the Russians. If it's not the Russians, I'll come back on the show and eat my tie. And this is a guy who had access to all the classified intelligence, all the, all the data that you would expect a, a Pentagon intelligence officer of, of his stature to have. This does not suggest to me that there is unanimity in the so-called intelligence community about Havana syndrome. And in fact, 
I mean, we have talked to former CIA officers. In some cases, we've had messages from current CIA officers sent to us by proxy that, you know, if not quite a cover up, that this is a debate that's still raging and it's been deeply politicized. And there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that have not been treated with the kind of respect um, and scrutiny that, that they deserve to. Um, so, Rahman, like, when we put this out, uh, we were joking, you know, this is going to get a lot of attention in the Western press and in the English language um, speaking world, but not necessarily in Russia. And yet this story took off like wildfire, the Russian version of the story, that is, uh, in a way that we haven't seen since the insider uh, unmasked the attempted or the actual assassins who attempted to uh, kill Alexei Navalny in 2020. Can you talk a little bit about the reaction in Russia? to the investigation. Yes, actually, it was pretty surprising for me because uh, I really thought that, like for most of Russian Russians, it's um, out of question that uh, Russian intelligence is ready to kill or uh, harm people uh, inside and outside the country. So, okay, recently they have killed Navalny. Why they wouldn't they kill or try to, I don't know, to uh, harm some foreign diplomats or especially CIA agents? So, but it, but it looks like that uh, people really think that this is some kind of a new red line that is crossed because this is still a different thing to when uh, I think it's both uh, they, it's, they understand both in Russia and in, in, in the West that there, there is a different thing when a dictator is coming after uh, his enemies and uh, would it be oppositioners, journalists, etc. Uh, would they be killed inside or outside of the country? And very different thing when you go after uh, diplomats or agents of uh, another superpower. Uh, it's uh, almost casus belli, actually. And this is uh, serious, um, not only for uh, our audience, but we see that uh, our uh, diplomats like Maria Zaharova, who is representative of Minister of Foreign Affairs and Piskov, they immediately started commenting this they usually try uh, either ignore this or try like jokingly uh, answer something uh, like about uh, how everybody around is insane and uh, uh, why uh, why they are just spreading this information blah 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 but they didn't do this i think because they understand that this time it is really really serious it's more serious serious than skripal poisoning it's more serious than uh, mh17 downing and many other uh, crimes, uh, because this is this is a new uh, new scale, uh, and this is violation of so-called Moscow rules when uh, agents this Soviet times Soviet period uh, time rule that you don't uh, attack um, like people on each other's grounds. So Soviets don't do anything on USA ground, and uh, Americans don't interfere into Russia. So actually, it was. Uh, really violated already in 2016 during the interference in American elections. But this was kind of, you know, uh, something happening in Internet. So, like, something something completely different. But uh, this time we see direct physical attacks and uh, possibly also on American ground. This is what we suspect. Um, and uh, everybody understands, and I think, like, Russian foreign minister understands that uh, like traditions that were shaped by centuries of international relations, they force America to react very tough if this is proven. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons why um, intelligence community was so um, cautious uh, with, uh, with this saying that we believe that it may be some other country because they understand the consequences. The consequence is very, very quick and you know, big escalation. Um, but now I think uh, what is already proven, at least uh, for me, my colleagues, and I think that uh, um, like politicians uh, and officials will be taken as proven, that this is not something psychosomatic, that this is a thing uh, that cannot be explained by uh, some illness this is this is an attack. This is proven by statistics, by medicals, etc., etc. So uh, th th this is 
this is starting point and, th and then we just have a simpler uh, choice who can really do this so there were theories about Chinese but I think if you look into our investigation there is more than enough proof to uh, explain that this is actually the, the Russians staying behind so we don't have lots of things to persuade people already yet if, if we already have pr proven that this is really happening and this was the toughest part actually because uh, I don't know about, about Krista, but for me, the, the part like how it really can physically uh, be done was the most um, like hard to believe part. Uh, and when we see that actually um, uh, in, 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 in medical sphere, in uh, physics, uh, uh, amongst physics experts, they have consensus that, yeah, it's possible there is um, uh, so-called... Um, uh, fray effect uh, when uh, microwaves are um, uh, um, um, accepted by ear as uh, sound waves and uh, harm uh, neurological um, uh, harm brain actually. So this uh, this is proven that this exists. So um, now it's just a question: who did it? And this this is uh, this is just a pragmatical question. And I think uh, that. Why now uh, American leadership is maybe uh, like more silent than some people would ex expect uh, this to be is that because they understand how hard the consequence uh, will be and they need to make their own official investigation. They can't rely on our investigation, on, on journalists. They need to make their own investigation. One, one other thing that, that sort of struck me in the course of researching, interviewing, reporting on this story was if you look at the victims, and, and by the way, you know, thousands of people came forward and said, I have Havana syndrome, right? I mean, there are a lot of false positives here because at one point the CIA said, if you, you feel like you suffered from these symptoms, come contact us. So you can imagine, I mean, I, our email box runneth over with people who think that, you know, yeah. they're being targeted all the time. And again, not every case is, is valid. But of the victims we interviewed and, and investigated, we looked at their medical records, we took full inventory of their prior histories, you know, could they be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder? Could this be psychosomatic? We kind of rule that out pretty quickly given their backgrounds and also the fact that they didn't know of the existence of one another and yet their symptoms manifested exactly the same way. But another aspect of this is, well, two points. One, it's called Havana syndrome because the first cases that became publicized around 2017 were recorded in 2016 in Havana, Cuba. And the hypothesis was, this is some attempt to disrupt U.S.-Cuban relations on the back of the rapprochement that was brokered by Barack Obama. And yet, in our investigation, we show there was an earlier case, at least one, in 2014 in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, and this was one of the positive identifications of a 29155 guy. The U.S. government employee actually confronted Igor Gorienko in the parking lot while he was surveilling diplomatic license plates. But of, of the clusters of victims, I, I, cohort, I think is the, the term of art they use, the ones that strike, that, that, that stand out the most are Russia hands, specialists who have dedicated their work, either at a diplomatic or an intelligence level, to countermanding Russian malign behavior or aggression in Europe, North America, you name it. And we have a, a section of this, this story, which is called the Ghosts of Kiev Station, where Basically, the CIA officers who inaugurated this rather incredible intelligence sharing program with Ukrainian military intelligence, GUR, starting around 2015, almost the entire station has either been targeted by, by, by this phenomenon or their family members have been targeted by this phenomenon. I, Michael, I mean, it's kind Michael. of incredible. Can, can I jump in here? Please, because yeah. I think uh, what you're saying is very relevant. First of all, the overwhelming... Um, correlation between incidents and area of expertise is Russia. So there's no question. So that's another uh, correlation that may imply causation at this point. But it's important to also say that in the same acknowledgement, if, if not admission statement by Patrushev, where he says we've disabled a hundred or more Western spies over the last few years, the next sentence literally talks about there are a lot of American spies and Western spies that have been promoting color revolutions in countries that don't want there. So this is literally talking about the Maidan, right? So right. that connection is made by them in their right. own motivation 
uh, speech. Yeah. I mean, what are the implications? I mean, Roman, you, you described this as possibly a casus belli. And, and two of the, the arguments we've heard from victims and, and people who think that this is very real and the Russians are behind it as to why the U.S. government isn't coming as clean as it might about it are twofold. One, well, then what do you do about it? Russia is a nuclear power that threatens on an hourly basis to reduce the entirety of the West to radioactive ash. Um, are we going to go to war with Russia? I mean, what, 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 with what dimensions of that war, what would the dimensions of that war look like, right? And the second, no less profound, are if we acknowledge that American spies and diplomats and DOD officials are getting hit all over the world and we can't protect our own people, there's nothing we can do about it, who the hell is going to want to volunteer or get recruited to any of these services, right? It is going to hollow out the foreign service. Michael uh, mentioned one very interesting uh, question, like what really Americans can do in this situation? What can be the response? And um, many people think that like uh, there is not a lot of uh, ways of like m instruments left uh, to pressure Russia. But let's not forget that for many years uh, of the existence of 2955, the main targets, no, main known targets, were uh, not Americans. So would it be poisoning of Skripal? Would it be uh, Gabriel? So it was uh, like if, if you would be kind of like head of American intelligence, that would be on periphery of your attention for many years. So they wouldn't right. be aware of these people, but uh, like why would they really invest a lot of effort to catch them and to bring them to justice? Because actually it's not like an American topic. And this is for the first time. This is not just an attack on American interests. It's just very explicit, very harmful, direct attack on uh, CIA agents, on uh, Ministry of Defense or officers. So like they just, uh, this is the question of uh, dignity of this service uh, to prove that you can't do things like this. If, if you can't do this and stay and just then, and then you put some people in a sanctioned list, especially those people who can't actually really travel if they work for Ministry of Defense. So that everybody understand that, okay, you can continue, that like nothing happens, right? So this would be green light for continuing not only these operations, but any operations against uh, American CIA agents and uh, diplomats and uh, other officers of Minister of Defense. So they just can't afford this kind of weak reaction. Uh, reaction. So this must be something strong. And uh, I think it can be something strong because if, if, they, if they would invest a, a lot of efforts into hunting these people, I mean 2955, into hunting uh, these agents around the world, this is not that difficult actually to arrest one or two of them who are still traveling. If me and Krista, like we already have a list uh, of s several dozens of them, we have just laptops and some, you know, some uh, experience of uh, looking into the database. We don't have millions of dollars. We don't have hundreds of people working for us. We just have some interest in this, but I don't know how, how Krista, I even don't count myself an expert on Russian military intelligence. I, I, I don't think that I, I can call myself, the, the, I'm just like, it's my hobby actually. So even if we uh, spending like just several years on this, found several dozens of these agents, I bet CIA and FBI, uh, FBI and uh, other intelligences have much more resources to find these people, to predict some of their travels, to arrest them on some countries where it is possible because they travel all around the world. Um, let's, let's hope for us that they will be just arrested and they will be brought to justice in public uh, in the middle of a, uh, attention of all over the world. That would be a lesson. We have never seen anything like this uh, happen. And I think Putin is very pragmatic. He is just opportunistic. So if he sees that there is no, um, no uh, consequence, why would he even think about stopping what he's doing? So I think that this is, this is the message that we should deliver now to uh, American uh, political elite because uh, it looks like that they just don't, don't understand the possible consequences of their silence right now. One question that, that keeps coming up, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's actually a, a, a mistake to say only Americans have been targeted. Quite a lot of Canadians yeah. have been targeted as well, diplomats, spies, and so on. 
But one question that, that I think is a legitimate one is, why no Brits, French, Germans? You know, why are the Russians only doing this to mostly North Americans, as far as we know? Uh, if it is just Americans, uh, there are lots of uh, American enemies who can possibly do this, like Chinese, for example. Uh, and um, I think no one would believe that Chinese would go after, for example, British agents, because like for China, this European stuff is not interesting that much. Um, so it, it looks like Russia wanted to make it super, super secret and very difficult to attribute to Russia because uh, they never, for example, used it against oppositioners, as we know, at least for now. They did it with Novichok, so they were not really afraid that Novichok would be attributed to Russia. Uh, but they, it looks like they never used microwaves against uh, any other enemies to make it more difficult to attribute it to Russia. I remember, speaking of the KGB, uh, interviewing years ago uh, Oleg Kalugin, um, and I asked him, you know, pointedly, uh, you know, why is it that your service can go after people in the UK, in France, in Germany, in Europe, but, you know, there's a, you, why aren't there cases of this in the United States? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, that, that was the rule, not against the main adversary, but Europe, that's our playground. So I think another theory could be maybe they're dealing with British, German, French spies in a different map. Um, but anyway, uh, great stuff as always. Um, and I, I suppose I have to conclude myself in it this time, so that's nice. Um, you've been listening to Foreign Office. I'm Michael Weiss, uh, editor of the Insider English. Uh, we've been discussing our investigation into Havana Syndrome, which was done with 60 Minutes and Der Spiegel. If you haven't seen the 60 Minutes segment, I encourage you all to do it. I think it's the most watched segment they've aired all year. Uh, and uh, we will see you next week. My guests have been uh, Roman Dabrhotov, the founding editor of The Insider, and Christo Grozev, the head of the investigations team at The Insider. Thank Thanks very much.